Senate will come back to order. The chair recognizes the distinguished senator from the fourth to recognize a very, 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 very special guest that we have with us today. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, if you'll give me attention just a minute. We have a, a honoree in our midst today. Uh, last night at Georgia Tech, uh, Melody DeBusey was presented with an uh, alumnus award for, for outstanding activity and as an alumnus of Georgia, Georgia Tech. And uh, we felt like uh, since she was she kind of belongs to us and that we ought to honor her as well. So I have a resolution here. I'm not going to read it to you, but just uh, let me just say as a matter of of our conversation that since melody has been here we've we've had the i think good good luck and and uh a great experience of, of someone who has great intellect uh someone who who cares about the people of the state and cares about the senate and works as hard as anybody i've ever seen her her legend as some of you know is that uh during the session she had a baby on friday and on monday she was sitting in the lieutenant governor's office working on <laughs> helping us work on the budget so I mean she is there's no doubt she's got some inner strength that some of us probably will, will never have but I would like for you all to stand and and give a warm uh, warm recognition to Melody Debussy That's the slowest I've ever heard her talk in the fewest words. Uh, <laughs> well done. Take up some special orders. Uh, uh, David, let me see that real quick. Uh, Senator, just uh, let me get your attention for a moment. Senator from the third, special order, Senator from 37th, then the Senator from the 17th, then the Senator from the 33rd, and then the Senator from the 51st, which I have not seen him. Chair recognized Senator from the 37th. President, I move that we agree to Senate Bill 401 as amended, and I'll speak to the amendment. I think it's on your desk. Read the caption. Senate Bill 401 by Senator Tippins and 37th and others, a bill we titled an academic code section 223 and 27 of the OCJ, relating to recognition of advanced proficiency honors courses and counseling and development of individual graduation plans and for other purposes.
let's read the amendment. The House offer the House offers the following amendment, amend SB 401 by inserting after courses on line four the following to allow funding for students taking dual credit courses at certain eligible post-secondary institutions which utilize non-standard return assessment to be and for other purposes. Amendment two by the House offers the following amendment, amend SB 401 by inserting after repeal on line seven the following to provide for annual age appropriate sexual abuse and assault awareness and prevention education and for other purposes. This amendment one by Senator Tippins of the 37th offers the following amendment. Amend the amendment to SB 401 by striking all matter from lines one through 25. That concludes the order. Chair recognize Senator from 37th for his, uh, speak to his motion. House Bill 401 was a bill that we have passed, uh, Senate Bill, excuse me, Senate Bill 401 bill that we passed had to do with clarifying uh, move on when ready procedures. The House added two amendments to it. We're going to amend it and strike the one amendment, which is in lines 1 through 25, as because these lines, although they're uh, a good amendment they are for higher ed and not k-12 and these this particular amendment is has been added to another bill as well so i'd ask your approval to uh, agree to senate bill 401 as amended if there's no other questions i'll yield the well no question senator the senator has moved that the senate agree to Senate Bill 401 as amended with the two amendments, all those in All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed no, Secretary will unlock the machine. Let me have the Senate's attention for just a moment. Uh, we're going to suspend this, suspend this vote. Sus the wrong caption was up. Let's correct it. Um, it is agreed as amended. Correct. Now, all senators um, in favor will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine.
On the motion, the yeas are 47, the nays are one. This bill, MC Rex Constitutional, or excuse me, the Senate has agreed to the House amendment as amended. Chair, can I Senate Member 17? Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate agree to the House amendment to the Senate substitute to Senate Bill 190 as amended. Read the caption. Senate Bill 190 by Senator Jeffries of the 17th and others. The bill will be titled an act to in transfer intake services of the Juvenile Court of Newton County to the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice pursuant to the Code Section 1511-69 of the OCGA for other purposes. Mr. President, the Senate, the House offers the following substitute to SB 190, a bill be titled an act to transfer and take services of the Juvenile Court of Newton County to the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice and for other purposes. Mr. President, Senator Strickland the 17th and others offer the following substitute to Senate Bill 190, a bill be titled an act to transfer and take services of the Juvenile Court of Newton County to the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice and for other purposes. That concludes the order. Chair recognize Senator from 17. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Um, Senate Bill 190, something y'all passed last year, was a local bill, went over to the House as a local bill as well, but it allows uh, Newton County Juvenile Court to basically opt in to the intake services from the state. And when it was over in the House, they added a little bit of language to it that clarified the, the funds being available for that, but they didn't change the effective date. It came back over here at the wrong effective date, so I worked with the Senator from the 43rd, we changed the effective date, and that's all this bill does. I'll be happy to yield for any questions. There are no questions. Thank you. Senators move. The Senate agree to the House amendment to the Senate substitute to SB 190 as amended. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the motion, the yeas are 51, the nays are zero. And the Senate has agreed to the House Amendment as amended. Uh, Chair recognize Senator from the 33rd. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate adhere to its disagreement to the House Amendment to Senate Bill 202 and that a conference committee be appointed. 
Senator is moving. Read the caption for conference committee. Senate Bill 202 by Senator Red of the 33rd and others. The bill we title enacted in Article 7, Chapter 4, Title 49. There's J. Relaying Medical Assistance Generally says to provide for an increase in the personal needs allowance to be deducted from nursing home residents' income. Mr. President, the House offers the following substitute the SB 202, a bill we title enacted in Chapter 5 of Title 30. The J. Relaying of Disabled Adults and Elder Persons Protection Act says to provide for the establishment of adult abuse, neglect, and exploitation multidisciplinary teams to coordinate and the investigation of and response to suspected instances of abuse, neglect, or exploitation of disabled adults or other persons and for other purposes. That concludes the order. Is there objection? Without objection, the conferees will be the senator from the 11th, the senator from the 45th, and the senator from the 33rd. 11, 45, and 33. All right, let me have the Senate's attention. Uh, 
Mr. Sergeant at Arms, are you ready back there? Uh, with all right, we have some special um, special guests. Let me ask that you have all the senators to please take your seats and cease all audible conversation at this time. We have some special guests. Uh, I'd like to recognize Mr. Sergeant at Arms. Thank you, Mr. Sergeant Arms. Please escort our good friend, Lieutenant Governor Pierre Howard, to the rostrum at this time. to recognize the Sergeant at Arms again. Please escort the new and improved trim Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor here to the Senate. <laughs> Very, very honored today to have uh, so many uh, of our Senate uh, friends that have joined us uh, along with uh, these two fine lieutenant governors that I've had the great fortune of serving with. Uh, we have uh, Jim Butterworth, Senator Butterworth. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> John Wiles is here with us as well. Let's give him a round of applause. Former Majority Leader Bill Stevens, who's here with us today as well. Former President Pro Tem of the body, Eric Johnson, uh, here as well. And also George Washington Hooks, ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you. Looking dapper today in that, uh, whatever color you would call that. Uh, also, Jack Murphy, who's here with us. Thank you, Jack. Sam Zipparilla is here with us, too. Thank you, Sam. Former Minority Leader Skin Edge uh, as well. Our good friend Perry McGuire as well, uh, who's here. And Preston Smith as well, a great uh, friend. Former Majority Leader Ronnie Chance uh, that's here as well. And now a great justice and a good friend, Billy Ray uh, as well. Let's give him great round of applause. Did I forget anybody? I got Perry. Yeah. Huh? Johnny Grant. Johnny Grant is here as well. Absolutely. That is great. Great to have all of you guys here. Uh, I will tell you that it's uh, very humbling to be in the midst. Uh, something that I had wanted to do for a long time is have a reunion of the lieutenant governors and Obviously, it would have been great uh, had Zell been able to be here as well. But uh, these two individuals, uh, remarkable in, uh, people that have meant an awful lot to me personally. Uh, and I, I get to see them not near as much as I would like to, but their, um, their, their counsel has been invaluable. And obviously, their contribution to the state uh, is very, very measurable as well. And we are very, very honored to have them here today as well. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to the President Pro Tem.
I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Pierre Howard. Thank you, Mr. President. I really appreciate the opportunity to be back home. And uh, I want to begin by saying that I left the Senate, but it has never left me. I sat right back there, um, sort of in the middle of the back, for 18 years. I represented my district uh, out in DeKalb County, and uh, right behind me sat a young man named Nathan Deal. And so uh, I was able to get to know him really well, and the first thing I did when I got elected lieutenant governor was to tell Lewis Massey we need to go to Gainesville. <laughs> so we went up to Gainesville, and we talked to uh, Senator Nathan Deal, who had had the temerity and uh, courage to support somebody for lieutenant governor who at first didn't have a chance, what most people thought, that he had helped me out. So uh, I said, Nathan, I need for you to run for uh, president pro tem. <coughs> he said, I don't know if I can get the votes. I said, well, we can get the votes. <laughs> and so um, anyway, I had, I had the pleasure of, of working with him. And then later, um, a guy from Central Georgia came up here. His name was Sonny Perdue. And uh, he came in my office one day. He said, you either need to play me or trade me. I said, how about pro tem? So he ran for pro tem. So I'm saying that because at least I showed good judgment <laughs> early, early in my career. Um, when I was uh, first in office, I, my chest was all swelled up. I just won an election, you know. And this little girl wrote me a letter and uh, she said, uh, Dear Lieutenant Governor Howard, we are studying government in my class, and I want to know, is there anything in state government lower than a lieutenant governor? <laughs> <laughs> and after I had been here for eight years, I knew the answer to that. <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> But I want, I want to just uh, thank uh, Casey. I should say Mr. President, but for now I'm going to say Casey. Because I, I want to tell a quick story and then I'll, I'll be, be down. But I was up here one day presiding and I saw him standing back there in the back and I motioned him to come up. He came up and stood right here. I said, uh, Casey, you need to get ready to stand up here because one day you're going to be up here. He said, you really think so? I said, I know so. And I don't know why I had that perception. It was maybe, maybe the first part of my second term. But I just, I always, uh, he and I always got along so well. And I always considered him to be a, a great friend of mine, along with uh, Mark Taylor. I remember when Mark first ran, uh, I had a guy working for me named Jim Comerford, who was a really, really good political operative, a really good, smart guy. And, uh, he went down there and helped help Mark in his first election. So I've just had a you know really great relationship with both these men standing behind me. And if you think about it, there have only been 11 lieutenant governors. And um, there are only three of us left. And I'm, I knew all but one. So I know I'm kind of getting to the end. The candle's kind of <laughs> burning down a little bit. I, didn't, I never knew me, Emmy Thompson, but the rest of them I did. And... Um, this Senate has had so many great people in it, and there's so many great people in it now. And I personally um, want to thank each one of you, especially my senator, Jen Jordan, who's new here, but I know she's doing a great job. I want to thank all of you for the time and effort that you make to make our state better for all of our citizens. I want to thank you for the time you take away from your families and the devotion that you have to our state. And I hope that as we go forward that we can remember that there are too many bears in the woods out there trying to do our country wrong for us to be so divided. And that one of the best things we can do is pledge to each other to remember that we're Americans first and Democrats and Republicans second, that our country is only, it only works when we are together. A house divided cannot stand. 
our country has got to be more, to, more um, united. And it's in places like this where we actually like each other that those kinds of um, steps toward progress can be made. And I want to thank uh, Lieutenant Governor Cagle for um, making this Senate a place where, to the degree possible, when, you have, when you've got partisan politics, everybody feels that they are a part. And so it's a, it's a real honor for me to be, him, be with him today as he presides on his last day as Lieutenant Governor, and I wish him all the best in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Let's hear from, uh, I, 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 before I actually uh, turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor, uh, I've had an opportunity to, to do, uh, probably spend a fair amount of time with him down in Albany uh, hunting at his plantation, uh, but he's actually gotten into horse racing, believe it or not, uh, <laughs> which is uh, remarkable and has some great, uh, great horses uh, that have been to the Kentucky Derby and everywhere else. Uh, I tell you, and one, one more money than you can imagine. So he is, he's actually here in official capacity to lobby for horse racing. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing. Please join me in welcoming Lieutenant Governor Mark Taylor. Thank you, Mr. President. Good afternoon to all of y'all. Thank y'all for giving us just a moment to honor President Cagle on this very busy 40th day. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mullis, for the invitation to be a part of this. I'm honored. My first visit back since I packed my bo boxes 12 years ago. Uh, Freddie Powell Sims, my senator, thank you for your hard work for District 12. The memories just come flooding back. Uh, for all of y'all who served uh, when I was Lieutenant Governor, I want to apologize. I thought I had learned how to preside from Pierre Howard and how to manage the Senate, but y'all will remember I wasn't nearly as good as he was. <laughs> and to whoever may follow President Cagle, I want you to know now, you cannot make the trains run on time in the Senate. It, it runs on its own special time. The presiding officer should preside and as Governor Howard said, make it a convivial place to work when at all possible. The, I, uh, I came to the state capitol first as a 12-year-old page for then uh, Democratic Majority Leader George Busby. Later I came as an intern to President Pro Tem Al Holloway, and at 29 I ran for the Senate, would not have been elected without Pierre Howard's help, and I ran in a six-week special election, and I went three weeks saying, elect me because I have experience working in the Senate. And it took them three weeks to find a side. They're going to run some ads and say, well, he was really just a page. He wasn't even an intern. <laughs> <laughs> but by that time, the house, the horse was out of the barn. Uh, enjoyed, honored so much to have served as a state senator and as lieutenant governor with so many of these fine people that are here uh, to honor uh, President Cagle. Uh, this is just a great occasion. Thank you. as. Uh, Governor Howard said for your public service thank you for the sacrifices that your families make so that you can serve and just a quick word to the Georgia Building Authority all of our staff security etc that opens up this building every morning for us and uh, allows y'all to do your work for the people of Georgia uh, I uh, really really appreciate the opportunity to be back with you and if we can help you down in Albany Georgia please give us a call thank you We have two more short items of business. I know everyone's ready to get to the calendar. And, uh, but first, I'd like to say thank you to all of these former senators and to these former lieutenant governors for taking time out of your lives, out of your schedules, to be here. It's a great, uh, great day to have all this inst institutional knowledge at one spot. And it's very, very impressive. We appreciate it very much. Right President Cagle, right I got the microphone, Mr. Mullis. <laughs> Mr. Secretary, if you'll read a resolution. <laughs> Senator Chuck Clay. I beg your pardon, you weren't recognized earlier. <laughs> yes. 
Senate Resolution 1071 by Senator Mullis and every other senator in the body, <laughs> recognizing and commending Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle and for other purposes. Whereas Casey Cagle was born on January 12, 1966 in Gainesville, Georgia, and whereas he has been married to his high school sweetheart, Nita, for 31 years, and is the proud father of three sons, Jared, Grant, and Carter, and his grandfather, to three remarkable grandchildren, Everett Grace, Levi Mick, and Wimberly Sullivan. And whereas at the age of 20, he opened his own business, a tuxedo shop. At the age of 28, he became the youngest member of the Georgia Senate. And whereas he was reelected five consecutive times to represent the 49th district in the Georgia Senate and served as chairman of the Senate Finance Committee and as vice chairman of the Senate Science and Technology Committee. And whereas, as a state senator, he championed legislation that would cut state income tax for the first time in history. And whereas, in 2006, the people of the state of Georgia elected him to serve as lieutenant governor, which made him the first Republican ever elected to that office. And whereas, as lieutenant governor, he supported tax cuts to make Georgia better for business, and he led the effort to cut $3 billion in government spending. And whereas, during the, his tenure as Lieutenant Governor, he has worked tirelessly to create pro -job, a pro-job culture throughout the state government and to create an educational system that focuses on the needs of individual children. And whereas, he was named one of the 100 most influential Georgians by Georgia Trend Magazine in 2006. And whereas, he was one of four public servants in the nation to be honored by the National Alliance for public charter schools with the Champion for Charters Award. And whereas he strongly advocated for Charter Systems Act to improve education in this state while providing a path to a career-based technology education. And whereas he launched the Georgia College and Career Academy Network to equip, equip students with the tools they need to thrive in a modern economy. And whereas his significant organizational and leadership talents his remarkable patience and diplomacy, his keen sense of vision, and his sensitivity to the needs of the citizen of this state have earned him the respect and admiration of the citizens of Georgia and his colleagues and associates. And whereas, as an avid triathlete, he leads Healthy Kids Georgia, which encourages local partnerships to help introduce children to healthy lifestyle choices under the slogan, Be Fit, Be Healthy, and Be You. He has worked with local communities to stem the tide of childhood obesity by introducing children to, way, to ways to improve their health and wellness. And whereas, he has published his first book, Education Unleashed, which celebrates the advancements made in education and outlines a vision for a public education, education system that will lead Georgia to, to the world's strongest labor force. And whereas, he has worked this session to provide Georgia with an historic reduction in income taxes to relieve a portion of the tax burden which they bear. And whereas he is a person of magnanimous strengths and unimpeachable reputation for integrity, intelligence, fairness, and kindness. And whereas it is abundantly fitting and proper that the outstanding accomplishments of this remarkable and distinguished Georgian be appropriately recognized. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Senate that the members of this body do hereby recognize and commend the Honorable Casey Cagle, Lieutenant Governor of the State of Georgia, for his outstanding life of service to the citizens of this state and for his significant contributions to the lives of Georgians and his many accomplishments and achievements. Mr. President, that completes the order. I'd like to call on our distinguished rules chairman to speak the resolution. Thank you, Mr. President Pro Tem. What a historic event we're witnessing now. The, the three remaining lieutenant governors of uh, this state. Uh, I am honored to be here today. I want to give uh, President Taylor um, the credit for molding me into the man I am today. <laughs> and also the physical fitness stuff that the lieutenant governor, uh, Cagle, currently is promoting. I guess I'm a poster child for that. <laughs> but, but let me tell you what an honor it is to have these three gentlemen here today. What an honor it is to honor our Lieutenant Governor who is experiencing his last signing die today. Please welcome President Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle.
Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all very much. Y'all can be seated. Um, just to make a couple of uh, observations. The. Um, one is, I mean, this is a, a, a huge honor to have so many people here uh, today. <coughs> the, um, a lot of emotions that go through uh, me at this time, um, being <coughs> here and seeing so many people. Um, I first just want to uh, comment on uh, all the people that make this uh, possible. And um, uh, the Secretary of Senate, um, David Cook uh, has been just a wonderful, wonderful partner, and I can't say enough great things about him, along with his staff, um, that make all of these things come together. And it is very, very tedious and challenging, um, but he is a he is a good man, and I appreciate you very much. Um, also. Um, <laughs> having the opportunity to reflect on other Secretary of Senate, uh, um, Bob Ewing, who has visited with us uh, this, this year as well, um, a wonderful, wonderful man who served with great distinction. Uh, Frank Eldridge, uh, who would many of you recall and remember uh, what a wonderful man uh, he was and so many just great, great memories of time that I spent with him as a young state senator and it mean an awful lot. Um, the body itself um, is, is such a unique place. Uh, it is certainly the upper chamber. Uh, I remind some of you that it takes three House members to make up one senator. I hope uh, that you never, ever forget that. Uh, but it is the deliberative body. Uh, deliberative in design, which I think is beautiful. Um, and oftentimes, I think we and I have fallen victim uh, to trying to allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And uh, deliberate uh, action is important in getting it right. And this Senate has always stood for that. And I appreciate uh, the willingness to define consensus uh, that ex exhibits each and every day, serving uh, with every single one of you. Um, both obviously that are present but also past. Um, we take away a little bit from each, each other and we learn when we have our ears open and we allow diversity of thought to enter the conversation. Um, it is the reason that I believe in making sure that the Democrat or the minority party has a strong voice um, I probably have not been perfect always. Uh, actually, Nita will tell you that I am not a perfect person, uh, but I am a committed person, I can assure you that. And, but this body has great history and great tradition. And uh, the next lieutenant governor that comes along, I know will respect it. And I know that each of you will as well, um, you know, to. think in life, um, sometimes you don't, <laughs> you never really know what course uh, the life is going to take you on. Um, and certainly, you know, starting out, I didn't ever think that I would be here today. Um, but I've had so many wonderful people around me. Um, having a beautiful high school sweetheart um, that uh, allowed, uh, said yes to me when I asked her to marry me. Uh, the journey 
that she and I have been on now for 32 wonderful years has been uh, remarkable. Um, it is one that I will will always cherish and obviously and our, our three boys who are just um, and just beyond um, beyond anything I could imagine and um, it has been a fun fun journey um, and one that that I will cherish for the rest of my life um, and and being involved with each of you and the friendships that you build and the good things that you're able to accomplish throughout public service is very important. And I think the last thing that I would just say is that um, never forget the reason that you're here. Um, it's not about the people out in the halls as much as some of them we love and some of them we may despise um, at times. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's about the people and it's about the fact that you have an opportunity to genuinely make a difference and um, when we are focused on the right things, uh, good things occur and happen and you as a body have so much and I have so much to be thankful for when I look back on the session and see uh, the great accomplishments that we have had that will be monumental and um, you know sometimes people ask me you know what's the most important legislation you've ever passed and the truth is, you know, it's really not in the laws that you pass. It's how you help people. That's where the most benefit comes from. And throughout my time in public service, uh, those are the things that give me the greatest degree of joy. Hold your head high as a public servant. Uh, I know there's a lot of chatter uh, in the environment today that we live in that, that uh, career politicians and establishment and all these other buzzwords. Um, I've never made a full-time living off of being in politics uh, and none of you do either. Uh, each of you have a job that you have to do and I think that's what makes it unique and special is that we truly are part-time legislators and that is our commitment and it keeps us connected to who we are and where we're from. And for each of you, for the way you have um, have conducted yourself and the way that you have befriended me and given me respect, I am humbled and I'm a better man for it. Thank you very much. Is there objection to the resolution? Hearing none. Resolution is passed. One last item. Mr. President, on behalf of the senators in this room and the staff, we would like to present to you the gavel and whatever this thing's called. <laughs> And we'll have, we're having a plaque constructed for it, and we've already got a replacement model. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. How about that? I'll use this one for the rest of the day, all right? All right. All right. Thank you very much.
Number from the fifty six, number fifty six. Now that I've got a little help here with uh, two former lieutenant governors, I'm going to let them help me out with two bills. So, <laughs> Secretary will, or excuse me, Chair recognized Senator from the 56, 56. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd ask that House Bill 729 be moved from the table. 729, read the caption. House Bill 729, Bill the Herald 106 and others, a bill we titled Enactment Article 1 of Chapter 5, Title 40 of the J general provisions regarding ad valorem taxation of property and for other purposes. Is there objection? Without objection, the bill will be removed from the table. We have a substitute to read. The Secretary will read. House Bill 729, Bureau of the Herald 106 and others, a bill we titled an act amendment, Article 1 of Chapter 5, Title 40 of the OCJ, relating to general provisions regarding ad valorem taxation of property, so as to repeal certain provisions relating to state ad valorem tax. Mr. President, Senate Committee on Finance offers the following substitute to HB 729, a bill we titled an act amendment, Title 40 of the OCJ, relating to revenue taxation, so as to repeal certain provisions relating to state ad valorem tax and for other purposes. That concludes the orders. Chair, and I, Senator from the 56, to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. House Bill 729 simply repeals outdated language from ad valorem. If you remember, we repealed that beginning uh, uh, back earlier uh, in 2010, and it's been off the books since 2016. This simply makes it so it doesn't need to be printed on local property tax bills. And then in Section 2, it simply clarifies one part of the indebtedness and intangible tax to assure nobody gets double taxed. Uh, if they were to refinance, they would not only get taxed, it would only be taxed on the future part. Uh, not the existing part of what was already indebted. We've got broad support from this from uh, all parties, and if there are no questions, I will yield the will. Questions on, no questions. <laughs> questions on the adoption of the committee substitute is the objection. Without objection, committee substitute is adopted. I'm going to ask uh, Governor Taylor to come on up. I'm going to have, have see if he can remember remember the script. I don't know if he remembers it or not. Let's see if it, let's see how he does. I used to could say it in my sleep, and I <laughs> totally forgot it. <laughs> Any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which is favorable to the passage of the bill? Chair, here's none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? Questions on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. <laughs> you got it down. I see the stomach trying to read it. Of the bill, the House bill, 
The yeas are 51 and the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. <laughs> Uh, it looks like he's still got it. He can pinch hit if we need. Chair recognize Senator 51st. Mr. President, I move that the Senate agree to the House Amendment to the Senate substitute to H.R. 238. Read the caption. H.R. 238 by Ruth Watson, 172nd and others, a resolution proposing an amendment to the Constitution so as to authorize the General Assembly to provide by general law for an annual allocation of 75% of the revenue derived from the state sales and use tax and for other purposes. Is there objection? Chair recognize Senator Fifty First. Thank you, Mr. President, or I should say, Mr. Presidents, since we have so many lieutenant governors in the room today. Since we're in such a bipartisan mood, this is in a very fitting and appropriate bill to do and agree on. This bill, as you recall a few weeks ago, deals with the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Act, <coughs> which is a constitutional amendment that dedicates up to half of the sales tax revenue from outdoor recreation equipment to the use of protecting our conservation lands and our state parks and green spaces around the states. The Senate lowered the, the percentage of this funding uh, in the Senate Appropriations Committee came out of the Senate, unanimously went over to the House. Since that time, we've underestimated what the dollar amounts would be to our change. The House put the change back to where they originally had it. We agree with that assumption and that assessment of those dollars that are being collected under this formula. So therefore, we're asking you to once again pass this resolution unanimously. It does require two-thirds vote to go to the ballot this, went this uh, November. And it's appropriate that the uh, Lieutenant Governor Pierre Howard standing behind me was formerly the in charge of the Georgia Conservancy, and we're honored to have him here today to preside over the passage of this bill. So, Mr. Senators and, the, and Mrs. Senators in the audience, please unanimously pass this resolution one more time. Mr. President, I'll yield the well. You, you have some questions, Senator, if you're willing to accept some questions. Chair, can I send 29 for a question? Thank you, Mr. President. Will Senator yield? I do. I'm sorry, Senator, I was having a little trouble um, hearing you earlier. The, the matter before us is the constitutional amendment that we voted on day 39, is that correct? When, whatever day that was, Senator, but correct. It is constitutional amendment. And could you just walk through one more time? I, I know we have the amendment in front of us saying we're replacing half with 80%. That's correct. Can, can you just tell us what exactly what that does to the underlying amendment? It changes the estimate of how fast that money would be accumulated. It does not change the cap. The cap remains the same, but we underestimated or overestimated how fast that money would accumulate. That's why we lowered it in the Senate Appropriations Committee. Since that time, we realized we made an error on that calculation and that interpretation. The House restored that number back to 80 percent, and therefore we agreed to that correction. Thank you, Senator. Yes, sir. Chair, can I send 45th for a question? Will the Senator yield? I do. What was the previous percentage that the Senate's position was? Uh, it was, we were at 50% and we're changing it back to 80%.
So that was the difference. We lowered it in appropriations committee because the chairman thought that we would reach that goal quickly and actually quicker than, than we had anticipated originally. We underestimated that number. We have since rescinded from that position and now we agree with the House. Senator, no further questions. Thank you. Thought it'd be appropriate that uh, we have a good conservation bill for our good friend, uh, Governor Pierre Howard, to preside over. I'm gonna let him preside over another one too because he doesn't get to read the whole script. But Senator, I'm gonna, or, or Governor, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> the Senator has moved that the Senate agree to the House amendment to the Senate substitute to House Resolution 238. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the Secretary will unlock the machine. On the motion, the ayes are 55, the nays are zero. House Resolution 238 is therefore passed. <laughs> I'm gonna let him, I'm gonna let him do the, the, the next bill. It's a good, another good conservation bill. We're gonna call up a Cherokee and I Center from the seventh, seventh. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent House Bill 785 be removed from the table. Is there objection? Without objection, the bill be removed from the table. Secretary will read the caption. House Bill 785 by Resident Nixon of 69th and others. The bill will be titled an Act Code Section 12.822 of the OCJ relating to definitions relative to solid waste management so as to modify certain definitions and enact new definitions. Mr. President, the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and the Environment offers the following substitute. House Bill 785, the bill was titled an act amendment coaches in 12822 of the OCJ relating definitions relative to the solid waste management. Amendment 1 by Senator McCuna of the 29th offers the following amendment. Amend the Senate Committee substitute to House Bill 785 by inserting after 2 on line 1 the fine. Amend code section 12529 of the OCJ relative to sewage and waste disposal, withdrawal, diversion, or impoundment of surface water, certificates required for vessels, marine toilets, and conditions for transfer of surface water, and for other purposes. That concludes the orders. Chair and I, Senator from the 7th, present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, the Senate House Bill 785 is an awesome measure that you have an opportunity to support, to continue to support our state stance as the number one place in which to do business. It's a great opportunity for some new technology that we have to be able to take non-recycled plastics out of landfills and make use of them uh, through this new technology. Uh, House Bill 785 makes uh, uh, certain definitions to clarify this in our code. EPD is in full support of the legislation before you. Uh, I would ask for your favorable consideration. I do understand that there's an amendment from the Senator from the 29th. Uh, I understand he's gonna speak to that amendment, but I believe he's gonna withdraw that amendment at the appropriate time. I appreciate his consideration with that. Uh, if there are no questions, Mr. President, I yield the will. There are no questions. Has the amendment been read? Okay. Chair recognize Senator 29 to uh, speak to the amendment. Mr. President, I had offered Amendment 1 to deal with a, a matter involving uh, EPD that I do think is important. 
uh, but after consultation with the author of the bill and several other members, I don't think this is the appropriate uh, opportunity for this debate. And so I'm going to return to my seat, and at the appropriate time, I'll ask to be recognized to withdraw amendment number one. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the will. Chair, recognize Senator 29th. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to withdraw amendment number one. Without objection, Senator's amendment will be withdrawn. Question on the adoption of the committee substitute is objection. Without objection, committee substitute is adopted. And we'll let uh, Lieutenant Governor Pierre Howard go through the script on this one <coughs> to bring it home. Would, would you? Does any other senator wish to speak for, other senator wish to speak for or against the measure? Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee's favor to pass the bill? The chair is non the amendment is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are there any objections? The chair is non the main question is ordered. Shall this bill now pass by substitute? The question is on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. And the secretary will unlock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the ayes are 52, the nays are 2. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, therefore passed.
chair recognizes the senator from the 51st for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate agree to the House Amendment to the Senate substitute to House Bill 332. The senator has moved that the Senate agree to the House Amendment of the Senate substitute of House Bill 332. Secretary will read the caption. House Bill 332, President Watson, 172nd. Now, this is a bill entitled an act to for the OSGGA relating to conservation and natural resources. So it's a repeal and reenact 6A relating to land conservation to provide for a short title to create the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Trust funding for other purposes. M Mr. President, the House offers the following amendment. Amend the Senate Committee on Appropriations. Substitute to House Bill 332 by replacing half with 80% on line 23, by replacing 25 with 40 on line 79, and by replacing half with 80% on line 292. That concludes the order. Chair recognizes Senator from the 51st. Mr. President, thank you. Senators, this is part two of what I just started a few moments ago. This is the enabling legislation for the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Act. Same change as the uh, changes that were made to the constitutional amendment language. We're just changing it back to the original language that the House passed, so we would ask for your unanimous support once again for this enabling legislation as well. Mr. President, I yield the well. There are no questions, Senator. The Senator has moved that the Senate agree to the Senate substitute of House Bill 332. All those in favor of the motion by the Senator from the 51st We'll vote yay. Those opposed vote nay, Mr. Secretary, and unlock the machines. The yeas are 49, the nays are zero. This motion, having received the requisite majority, is therefore agreed to.
Chair, recognize the senator for the 51st for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Once again, I move that the Senate agree to the House substitute as amended to SB 445. The senator has, from the 51st has moved that the Senate agree to the House substitute of Senate Bill 445 as amended. Mr. Secretary, if you'll read the caption. SB 445 by Senator Jutes of the 51st and others, a bill be titled an act to entitle through to the OTJ relating to highways, bridges, and ferries to provide for standards for contracts entered into the, by the Department of Transportation, provide for a contract bidding process and award procedure, and for other purposes. Amendment 1 by Senator Jutes of the 51st offers the following amendment. Amendment SB 45. 445 House sub by inserting after procedure on line four of the following to provide for limitations on restrictions of motor commercial motor vehicle traffic on certain county road systems by inserting after penalty on line six of the following to revise provisions regarding the procedure for disposition of property and for other purposes. That concludes the order. Recognize the senator from the 51st. Thank you, Mr. President. We're about to lose track of names. We've got so many people up here presiding. It's, uh, it's the bill before you is the bill that we passed also earlier this year. It's the annual housekeeping bill for the GDOT. It's the Georgia Department of Transportation. As you may recall, we had some housekeeping language in that bill dealing with how we deal with surplus properties. It prohibited camping from underneath our bridges and overpasses. The amendment that you have before you today basically grandfathers in uh, local road requirements for commercial roads and driveway access permits in a county. These are, uh, these are conditions that would be grandfathered in in, the, in this new city that was created recently. Uh, it would allow those current requirements to stay in place so that the industrial uh, development folks in those areas would continue to be able to operate their businesses. Pretty simple, straightforward amendment. Mr. President, I'll take any questions or yield the well. Senator, there are no questions. The Senator from the 51st has moved that uh, the Senate agree to the House substitute of Senate Bill 445 as amended. All those in favor of the motion will vote the yay switch. Those opposed vote the nay switch. Mr. Secretary, lock machines. The yeas are 50, the nays are zero on the motion. The, so the motion has prevailed and the, agreed ha the Senate has agreed. Recognize the Senator from the 13th for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that we remove from the table House Bill 605. Mr. Secretary, if you read the caption, House Bill 605. House Bill 605 by Representative Spencer, the 180th, and others. A bill will be titled Enact Amendment Article 2 of Chapter 3 of Title 9 of the OCJ, relating to specific periods of limitation so as to change provisions relating to the revival of certain claims involving childhood sexual abuse and for other purposes. Mr. President, Senate Committee on Judiciary offers the following substitute to HB 605, a bill be titled an act amend 
Code section 9333.1 in Chapter 15 of Title 17 of the OCJ relating to actions for childhood sexual abuse and victim compensation, respectively, so as to extend the statute of limitations for actions for childhood sexual abuse under certain circumstances and for other purposes. Amendment 1 by Senator Kirk of 13th and others offers the following amendment. Amend the Senate Committee substitute to HB 605 by deleting harm from the on lines 21 and 22 by replacing line 76 with the following. Three, for occurrence of childhood sexual abuse committed on and after July 1st, 2018, notwithstanding Code Section 9333 and in addition to and for other purposes. Mr. President, that concludes the order. Chair recognizes the senator from the 13th to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Let the record reflect I am wearing a skinny tie in honor of our uh, pe president's uh, last day, current president. And uh, Today I bring to you House Bill 605. This is a bill you've heard a lot of talk about. It's the Hidden Predator Bill. Now, it's been brought to my attention that um, everybody didn't have, everybody's copy in their book may, may not have had all the pages. So they're handing out some now. More than likely yours did. Mine did. Uh, this is right out of my book. But if yours didn't have a page or two, then it's being distributed now. Please let them know because um, we want you to have the bill. We want you to be able to look at it. So you've heard a lot about this bill this year, I know. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it. There's been a lot of meetings about it. Um, I've been here four years, carried a lot of legislation. And uh, I think I have met more on this bill than perhaps any other bill that I've carried. And I've carried some pretty heavy uh, legislation over the four years. Let me, let me just kind of give you a little background about why this is such a complex issue. It really is, it's very difficult. According to the National Center for Victims of Crime website, one in five females and one in 20 males are victims of childhood sexual abuse. I looked at several other um, sources and there are similar numbers, so that's, those are pretty good numbers. One in five females, one in 20 males, are victims of sexual abuse. Children are also most vulnerable to sexual assault during the ages of seven and 13. Think about yourself when you were seven, between the ages of seven and 13, and think about what all is going on in your life at that point in time. You certainly were very vulnerable. Um, it's a very <coughs> underreported crime, and let me tell you why. Involved with this crime are elements like shame, embarrassment, and really, when you're a child, you're just trying to fit in. You know, some of us as adults are just trying to fit in as well. But in childhood, it's really, really difficult. It's tough. It's hard. So when you think back, you kind of understand this was something that just wasn't talked about a whole lot in society for many, many years. It's talked about a lot more today. And what's happened is a lot of cases have come to light that this did happen, and it's being talked about more. We had the Me Too movement, which is something unrelated, but, well, it's related, but it's different than what we're talking about here in the Hidden Predator Bill. Now, the author of this bill told me that his research said the average age of discovery of childhood sexual abuse was 42 years old. Why would that be so? Why would it wait? If, you, if something happened to you during childhood, and let's just say it was between 7 and 13, why would you wait until you were 42 until you started talking about it, until you dis discovered it, if you would? Some believe it's due to suppressed memory. Well, this was well published and talked about in the 1980s and the early 90s. The thought is that childhood sexual abuse was so traumatic that when it happened, that the child disassociated themselves from the event. And oftentimes, these are repeated offenses. 
oftentimes a child isn't just sexually abused one time. It, it's, it goes on sometimes for years, many, many years. So the thought is they disassociate themselves in their mind. They set it aside even when the event is occurring, and then they repress those memories for many, many years. And it's through therapy later on in life that they end up in therapy for one reason or another that this comes to light. They've repressed the memories, and repressed memories can lead to many things. They can lead to things like eating disorders, especially more common in females, depression, suicidal ideations, substance abuse, and the list goes on. But I want to share with you two cases I'm familiar with. Uh, my background is I'm a licensed professional counselor. I've practiced. I have worked with people who were victims of childhood sexual abuse, so I know a little bit about it. And I want to tell you how it affected two cases I know. The two cases I'm going to share with you were both males. I could just as easily tell you stories about females as well. The first guy if you knew him, you would think there's a man's man. He's an outdoorsman. He a uh, nice looking guy, very smooth with the ladies. But he had a problem, and his problem was infidelity. And the infidelity is what got him into counseling. Well, over the course of therapy, it came out that he was sexually abused as a child. And in order for him to feel like a man, he had to have those type of re those infidelity uh, relationships. That kind of changes your perspective of a guy like that when you when you understand a little more. The second guy I want to tell you about was a big guy also, and he had a lot of anger issues. In fact, that's what got him into therapy. He was abusive to most everyone in his life. He was a big, strong, tough guy. So most people, he was, one of the, he was that guy that was in town that you knew something wasn't right, but you didn't really want to confront him. He was just a big, brawly guy. But he got into some trouble as a result of his anger and was ordered into therapy. After over a year of therapy, he broke down one day and cried like a baby. And he told his story of childhood sexual abuse. And so you see, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way a lot of the victims deal with it. They, it's not that they totally forget. Some do. They totally remove that. But some, it's there. They know it's there. Maybe they don't know it all, but they build a other things. They have a wall between them and the pain. And they would rather the community see that wall than what really, truly is going on inside of them. So here are my takes as a clinician on childhood sexual abuse. Repressed memories are very real, but very rare. Some data that I looked at suggested 18 to 58% of victims of childhood sexual abuse repress their memories. I feel that victims in that category will actually be in the single digits, probably less than 5%. That's my limited experience and what I know about childhood sexual abuse, having worked with victims in my career. So um, the American Psychological Association puts it this way. Most victims remember all or part of what happened, although they may not fully understand or disclose it. So I think I'm in pretty good company there and what I just shared with you in my thoughts. So let's look at this bill. Please understand, this is a very complex bill. It is full of emotion. I have sat through hours, literally hours of testimony, and the Judiciary Committee has as well, where we had victim after victim after victim who are now adults come before the committee and tell their story. It's heart-wrenching. And what our job is, is to find a balance where we certainly want to punish the perpetrator. We certainly want to punish any entity that we, the term I began using is egregious, an egregious entity that allowed something like this to happen in their organization. But we also want to be, want to be fair to all organizations because I want to tell you, and this is a conversation I had at one point with the governor on this very bill. I said, you know, Governor, and I've seen it today, 
We have children at the Capitol every day. And I've seen them out there today, walking up and down the halls. Someone could be sexually assaulted here at the Capitol. Does that make the state of Georgia's Capitol, this building right here, this body right here, an egregious entity? I don't think anyone would say yeah. I think we all would agree that's not. And so you find a balance somewhere. These things happen, and we're trying to find a balance. So please bear with me as we go through the bill. In 2015, um, we changed the code and opened a window for going after perpetrators for civil damages, and that set a standard going forward. So in this bill, if you'll look with me, one of the things that we're doing, you also have a friendly amendment before you, and I'm going to try to go through it as we go through the bill as well. So you have here uh, in Section 2, and this is the language that we had that we passed in 2015, just three years ago. And you see, at that time, we made the age up to 23. Um, but we've actually raised that age now through the age of 30. That means if you're 30 years old in nine months or 12 or 11 months, you can file a, a case, okay? If you realize and discover you, you were a child or a victim of childhood sexual abuse. So um, in the amendment, you're going to see one phrase that was added on line 21 was harm from thee. We're taking that back out in our amendment. Um, we're, we're just going to remove that from the language. Flip on down to line 17 through 21. Oh, that is 17 through 21. My bad. <laughs> uh, let's see. Again, we, we changed it 23 years to 30 years. Um, on the second page, on line 30, uh, 25, this is looking forward. Notwithstanding Code Section 933, that is the code section that was changed, a plaintiff who is between the ages of 23 and 30 may bring a civil action for recovery. So there's, here's where I'm showing you that you had, you, up, uh, up to age 30, you can bring action if you find and later discover you were a victim of childhood sexual abuse. The rest of this is, is the language that's there with the exception of a couple of things you see underlined there on line 41 and 49. Section three is our look behind. Now, we've been criticized as a chamber for not having a look behind in our bill, but there is a look behind, and this is it. It's, it's in this section. The first part here is just kind of some definitions. You can read those for yourself. The meat of it begins on line 62. So it says very clearly on uh, line 62, plaintiffs who were time barred, that means it was time limited, the statute of limitations had ran up, ran out, they now can file up to age 31 years. So in other words, up to 30 years and the day before you turn 31, you have the right to file. A um, couple of things I want to sh share with you. This is line 67 through 69 deals with the person. And in order to bring those charges against the person, you have to have a preponderance of evidence. Now, I've learned a lot of legal terms uh, <laughs> being on the Judiciary Committee. In fact, um, Senator from the 15th, I've learned a lot of them I didn't really want to know, but, uh, <laughs> but I've learned them. So preponderance of evidence, this is what I do understand. I think we all can. You've seen the legal symbol is always involving the scales. And let me, let me relate to how preponderance of evidence is. When I, and, and this will be something all of us in this room can relate to. When I ran the first time, I won by 200 and some odd votes. That gave me 51%. If you put 50, for 50 ounces on one side of that scale and 51 ounces on the other side of the scale, it's just going to tilt that scale. That's a preponderance of evidence, okay? <clears throat> Line 70 through 75 deals with the entity. An entity, when such entity had the responsibility of care, um, it goes on to talk about what all, you know, they, they did wrong. But it also says, uh, this is important on line 75, that you've got to, when you file, not only did they cover up what they did, this is what I think makes an egregious entity. When they covered up, somebody went to someone in charge and said, you know what, this happened to my child or this happened to me. And instead of taking action, they cover it up. 
And so this says that that cover-up, in order for you to file these charges, had to continue on through at least the past 12 years. That takes you back to when you were 18, right? 18 and 12 gives you 30. <laughs> so that's where that came from. Line 76 through 83, I just want to point out a few things here. Um, if you have discovery, like I talked about earlier, that happens oftentimes in therapy, uh, when you have discovery, you have one year from that time to file those charges. You can go back. And then you've got to show that it says on beginning on line 80, you, the date the plaintiff discovered evidence, you've got one year from the date the plaintiff discovered evidence, that such entities' actions involve harboring, assisting, concealing, or withholding information about that person. So the entity knew they were somebody in their organization who had sexually assaulted a child, and they did not act or they acted irresponsibly, and we're going to define that here in just a minute in this bill. And you'll also see on line 83, this goes back to that 12 years again as well. So what we have on lines 85 through um, the next page, actually, through 99, for purpose of this paragraph, here's, here's, here's how we're going to define these things we talked about, the harboring, assisting, concealing. So it says on line... Um, 87, intentional harboring, assisting, concealing, or withholding information about the person by an entity shall include at least two of the following. Here's what they did. They intentionally failed to timely report suspected child abuse. They, in, and we add the word intentional here. This is part of what you've got here in your um, amendment. We're going to say intentionally harbored, attempted to har harbor, or assisted them. They intentionally, on line 93, allowed such person to continue working. That's wrong. Uh, line uh, 95, they intentionally assisted the person. We're adding intentional, uh, intentionally there uh, in the uh, amendment. So they intentionally assisted the person in being transferred or moved. They helped them get another job. Okay, this person wasn't good here, but you know what? We're going to ship them over there <laughs> and, and, and get them out of our hair. Maybe that's the way the entity want to deal with it. We say that's egregious. You shouldn't do that. And then on the next page, on line 97, they intentionally, and we remove the word, our conscious indifference, uh, but they in intentionally concealed, attempting to conceal, or assisting another individual or entity in concealing or attempting to conceal such person's alleged conduct. They just covered it up at the end of the day. If they did that, if an entity did that, I don't care who they are, they're guilty of an egregious crime against children. Now, they may not, they weren't the perpetrator, but they allowed an environment, they created an environment that allowed a perpetrator to do what they do. And they often want to go to places where children congregate. On lines 100 through 148, all that, I'm just going to make it easy for you, okay, this on line 101, it talks about convin uh, convincing evidence. Um, by clear and convincing evidence, so go back to my, my scale thing again. Preponderance, I won by 51%. This last election, I won by 72 plus percent. So that's, the, the scales are going to tip a little more, right? That's clear and convincing evidence, okay? And what this whole language is in this section deals with malpractice. It, the malpractice code and it's what it says is that an expert someone in the field of psychology would say Johnny suffered childhood sexual abuse that would go to the court they would seal that document but it would be there for the and that was to help the judge say okay this case can proceed we have a professional uh, in the field who says yes this did, <coughs> did happen so that's pretty much what that, that's covering that's exactly what that's covering and through line 148 on line 149 um, this is something that we added in the Senate. It uh, talks about the period of li limitations, and we did two things. We, we did one in here. We have the um, tolling is in here, and tolling is good for the plaintiff. Um, that means that the statute of limitations can end, and that's on uh, line 150. And then we added on line 151 the term latches. Latches is good for the defendant. What this means, and we also, if you see on 152, we gave the discretion to the court. So we gave the judge some discretion. They can use some judgment 
when someone brings a case before them and they want to say <clears throat> something happened many years ago, it just, it's just been discovered, the judge has some leeway here by us adding these, uh, this paragraph to, uh, to decide, hey, this case needs, can proceed or maybe it does, just doesn't have enough evidence right now to proceed. Um, section 4 is a safe harbor that we added into our bill for entities um, that are doing the right thing and so they'll know what to do because it continued to come up as we had hearings on this bill who were they supposed to tell who are they supposed to report to so we kind of clarified that for them in um, uh, line 155 uh, through 165 and um, what it says there um, that um, for the purpose of the liability when the entity is unincorporated because that was one of the things that came up some civic groups may be unincorporated and there was the concern was that uh, maybe that civic group has a hundred members but it's only got 20 active members maybe somebody one of those other 80 or several of those other 80s were active 20 years ago and they hadn't been active in the group since but their name's still on that roll we didn't want them to be responsible for something that came up that they knew nothing about so this this clarifies that it gives a safe harbor and it makes it very clear unless you were involved in the childhood sexual abuse and just because your name's on a roll of an entity doesn't make you responsible for what happened but if you were involved it, it then you're not clear at all um, the second part there lines 160 through 165 um, the entity shall be deemed not to have intentionally harbored or concealed if they did if they follow code section 1975 that's the mandated reporter law so if they did what they're supposed to do under the law they did the reporting they're covered and so I think entities need to understand that they have a responsibility and we also added there that they did this timely and they reported uh, or timely reported to the parent or guardian of the plaintiff now that doesn't mean that uh, it gets them off the hook from being a mandated reporter. If you're a mandated reporter, you're a mandated reporter, and all entities should follow that code. But it also means that maybe you're, you don't fall in that category for whatever reason. Then you ought to tell somebody. That's what we're saying there. And the parents are the, are the people to tell. <clears throat> Sections 5, 6, and 7 is something else that the, the, the Senate has added. What this does is uh, give victims uh, access to uh, funds that the criminal justice uh, uh, has, um, criminal justice council has for victims of, of crimes. And this will give up to $3,000 for people who have suffered childhood sexual abuse. And it will cover their costs for counseling and any loss of wages going back and transportation, I think, also back and forth for counseling. Um, just just to try to reach out and and give some other relief to uh, to the victims so and then that that's pretty much the bill section 8 you've seen many many times on every other piece of legislation we got so um, as we sat together as a committee we felt that these are fair parameters for all parties and we didn't focus on any particular case we didn't focus on how we're gonna help this this case over here or the, these cases over here we focused on what's the right thing to do for the children and the safety of children in Georgia and what's the right thing to do to protect entities who do want to do it by the right way who do want to report if something were to happen in their organization how do we protect them so that their civic work can continue to happen and, and religious work can continue to happen in our community so <clears throat> Um, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, Mr. President, I'll take any questions that there may be uh, on this bill. Did I cover everything on the, uh, I think I covered everything here on the amendment. Oh, we actually are taking out indiscretion of the court, but we still are giving the judge some leeway with the latches on 152. All right. Any questions? Senator from the 31st is recognized for a question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Does Senator yield? Certainly. On lines 95 and 96, it's referring to intentionally assisting the person in transferring, um, assisting the person being transferred, et cetera. Yes. So if um, an entity decided that this person was no longer going to be associated with the entity, and then someone called and asked for a reference on the alleged perpetrator, if you will, and they did not disclose the reason that they terminated that person, would that be intentionally assisting that person in being transferred? <coughs> Very good question. Really what you're falling into now are laws surrounding human resources anyway with any company. Um, really my understanding is having owned a company, having had employees, terminating employees and hiring employees. About the only thing I would ever say anyway is we'd hire them back or we wouldn't hire them back, and that's as far as my conversation ever went with any employer. Um, you really can't because at this point, unless they're charged, it's alleged at this point. So what we did, we just said just don't assist them in transferring to another job or <clears throat> the other thing we didn't want them to do is transfer within their organization because Many of these groups will have organizations all over the place, so let's move them from here to over yonder. They're not our problem anymore. That's not the right way to deal with this. I'm, I'm, if you would yield, um, I'm, I'm not certain that I understand and I'm comfortable with that yet. Clearly, if you moved them to another role within your company, that you, you would be at some risk there. Sure. But if you terminate someone, you sever that relationship with this person who was per engaged in your business, and someone calls you, and the question is, would you hire them again? I guess that answer is a little bit, since you terminated them, I'm, my question is, if you just simply say, that person no longer works for me, are you assisting them in getting employment at a subsequent employer or an association with a subsequent entity? Good question again. And, and what this is, the reason this is here, this is language I put in um, the bill myself. Um, the reason it's here is if this gives you also a guideline if I am the victim or I'm, rep or I'm not an attorney, but if I, have, if I were and I was representing a victim, then I would have to prove that. So that would be the burden of proof would be on me to prove that I did, that at the, the entity did assist them in some way, some shape, some form. I think, personally, I think if they said that they, we'd never hire them again, that'd probably be the end of it. I'd look for the other four things here to see if they're guilty of one of those other four. So you understand the entity would have to be guilty of only two of these five things listed. Would you yield for another question? Sure. Lines 89 and 90 refer to reporting the suspected child abuse to a parent or a guardian. Right. Now, in the case of, uh, I think this bill does a good job in setting forth the, the atmosphere that we're going to work in going forward. But looking back, um, I can imagine I have some concerns about perhaps, you know, let's say it's a daycare facility and this is the pickup line and mom's coming through to pick up the child and you, 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 you tell her there may have been an incident here. There's no paperwork, there's a conversation that was brief. The parent may not want to engage in that at the moment. She, he or she may want to converse with the child and how, how do you how do you meet the requirements of intentionally failing to re or, or what would the process be in the court whenever the plaintiff states I told mom she doesn't remember that I told her how, what's the standards for um, appearing before the court and meeting these requirements 
Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, first of all, I, I always said, of course, my background is, is we did case management and I'm a clinician, so document, 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 because what you say is what you document is what you take to court, is what you'll stand on in court. Here's where this came from. We're, the, the mandated reporter law in the state of Georgia goes back to the 1930s. Do you think it looked like it does today in, in the 1930s when it was first implemented? No, it doesn't. So it's been added on to, I think the 70s there was a big revision. And so the idea behind this is that let's go back to the discovery. Let's go, and, and let's say that someone, this goes back now years before, they've got a one year from, from when they discover, they can go back. Uh, and, and so uh, let's say that um, the um, mandated reporter laws didn't include you at that time or the entity at that time. But they did take action. They did tell the parents. That's where this came from. I just have a fear that the parent might go along with the child is presumably an adult now, but the parents want to support the child. And they say, oh, yeah, you know, um, I, I, I wasn't made aware of that. This in no way allows them, Senator, I, I hope I didn't cut you off, and if I did, I apologize, but this in no way al allows them to uh, not follow the mandated reporter laws, and they're pretty, pretty extensive now today. So this going forward is not going to let you off from right. being a mandated reporter and doing what you are, are supposed to do, and that's reporting to uh, law enforcement and DFACS. So the section that I'm referring to, lines 85 and following, is that in the prospective part or the retrospective part of this It's law? there because we're, we're dealing with both. So it does apply to the retrospective portion and that it doesn't entity. give you relief from being from your man, from being a mandated reporter at all. I'm not sure what those mandating reporting requirements would have been, and I think you speak truthfully when you say we have strengthened those laws and laid that out more clearly. But when we open up this window for some 30 years, um, I, my fear is that someone has, is going to get caught in this when they, at the time, they were doing what they thought would have been appropriate. And I'm trying to get, I'm honestly trying to get something from you to give me some comfort level with that. I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to, but I hear, I hear what your concern is. And believe me, we had a lot of discussion around this in the committee. Um, we had all of our uh, judiciary members working on this. Uh, it was heard by the full committee. Um, and this is the best language we could come up with. Gentlemen, gentlemen, uh, uh, to the gentleman in the well and yes. to the gentleman from the 31st, time has expired, but I, I don't want to cut you short of your discussion. Okay. But if you could bring it to a close so that we can move on. Thank I'm you. I'm finished. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, you okay. Your time has expired. Okay. Thank you. I please support this bill. The chair recognizes the senator from the 42nd. To speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'll be brief. I just wanted to point out a couple of the questions that surround this, the Senate substitute to this uh, 2018 Hidden Predator Act, some of the flaws that I see in this legislation. I'm hoping that it can be strengthened as it um, goes through the process for the remaining hours that we have today. The intent of the Hidden Predator Act is clear. We are trying to bring justice to survivors of sexual abuse while holding the perpetrators and those who protected them accountable for their crimes. But it seems that this substitute either um, specifically forecloses that opportunity to those that have come forward and filed actions in the uh, several years since we passed the first Hidden Predator Act in 2015, or at a minimum is very unclear that it would permit uh, some of those cases to go forward. And it would seem both wrong and ironic if we close the courtroom door, close the doors of justice to those who have had the courage to 
stand forward in the last uh, couple of years and prevent them from having their day in court. Now, if we're concerned about a flood of lawsuits, which I understand, of course, could be of concern to some of the people, some of the entities that feel that they might be vulnerable in this situation, there's language we could craft that would not specifically foreclose those who have stepped forward, who have pending cases, but, but also ensure that there wouldn't be some flood of lawsuits. And, and, and you know, before I um, yield the well, I just want to take just a minute to add on to the senator from the 13th's comments about why it's so critical that we take this issue and the ability of these folks who have stepped forward um, to seek justice very seriously. You know, the, the statute of limitations is incredibly important in protecting due process rights. Uh, we, all, we all know that, we all believe in that. But childhood sexual abuse is also dissimilar from most other um, types of crimes for which redress is sought uh, within our court system. When it occurs, children almost always do not have the language or understanding to recognize sexual assault when it happens to them. They have a tendency to defer towards authority figures. The abusers routinely exploit that. Childhood sexual abuse is accompanied by fear and shame, further delaying the filing of charges even after the survivor realizes what has happened to them. And of course, as the senator from the 13th says, I believe it was age 42 that the senator mentioned, um, sometimes it takes that many years to grow up to realize that's what happened, to fully grasp it, to fully cope with it, and then to finally come forward. So that's why this is so important. And you know, I don't think it was really until the last couple decades when um, originally the Catholic Church scandal sort of broke open and it permeated the uh, consciousness of the public. I think that's really when the, the consciousness of the public had for the first time truly understood the devastating ramifications of childhood sexual abuse. It wasn't as though people thought it was okay before that really uh, burst onto the, to the scene, to the news, but it was only then that we fully understood how absolutely destroying it is to so many lives, how many people who have been abused at that age will never recover. So all that is simply to say that this is a unique situation. We are doing the right thing and engaging in this conversation. Of course, there are th th times have changed. You know, the record keeping has changed. The mandatory reporting has been improved. That is all a good thing. I am simply up here to say that this bill right now is very unclear whether or not we are slamming the, the courthouse door as to those folks who have already come forward in the last couple years. And at a minimum, we should make it clear that we are not doing that. So it's got flaws. I'm gonna vote for it today and I encourage you to do the same. I hope that it goes through the process, we'll be able to improve it, and that we'll all be able to cast a green vote for final passage later on tonight. But if it isn't improved, it's so weak here, it's like a breadcrumb at most, and I would, um, if we don't improve it, I, unfortunately I'll have to come back up here and say that um, it's been so weakened as to be meaningless to too many victims, other than those who are abused after uh, July, June 30th, 2018. And um, that would just be, such a, a sad, sad state of affairs. So, Mr. President, I know that time is running short. I am going to um, yield the well unless someone has an extremely urgent question. Thank you, Senator. Recognize the Senator from the 56th. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd move the previous question. The Senator has moved to the previous question. All those in favor of moving to the previous question will rise, stand, and be counted. All those in favor of moving to the previous question will rise, stand, and be counted. Reverse. The yeas are 32, the nays are 6. The motion has moved to the previous question. Mr. Secretary, the previous question is now ordered. The question now is on amendment number one. All those in favor, is there objection? 
Hearing no objection, the amendment is adopted. The question is on the adoption of the committee substitute as amended. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute as amended? Hearing none, the committee substitute is adopted as amended. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection? Senator from the Sixth, why do you rise? To make a motion. Mr. President, pursuant to Senate Rule 5-1.8, which prohibits the senator from voting upon any question if that senator has a conflict of interest, I move for unanimous consent to be excused from the HB 605 vote. The senator has asked to be excused. Is there objection? There is no objection. The senator is excused from voting. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there a question? To, is there objection to agree? What do we got? What do we got? Senator from the 55th, beg your pardon. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask unanimous consent to excuse the senator from the 38th. Without objection, the senator from the 38th is excused. Are there any more motions to be excused? Hearing none. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is there objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which is favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall the main question now be put? Are there any objections? The chair hears none. The main question is ordered. Shall this bill pass by substitute? The question is on the passage of the bill by substitute. All those in favor vote yay. All those opposed vote nay. Mr. Secretary, if you'll unlock the machines. On the passage of the bill, the yeas are 51, the nays are zero. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. What do you got? Chair, can I send it from the eight? Eight. Chair recognize Senator from the ninth. Mr. President, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to remove HB 795 from the table. Read the caption. House Bill 795 by Resident Gravely the 67th and others, a bill was had an act in Chapter 2 of Title 34 of the OCJ, filling the Department of Labor, so as to authorize the Commissioner of Labor and for other purposes. Is there objection? Without objection, the bill will be removed from the table. I thought he just did. No? Read the amendments. Amendment 1 by Senator Martin of the 9th and others offers the following amendment. Amend HB 795 by deleting lines 1 and 2, inserting lieu thereof the following. Amend Title 34 of the OCJ relating to labor and industrial relations was to authorize the Commissioner of Labor to perform certain and for other purposes. Amendment 2 by Senator Tillery of the 19th and others Offers the following amendment, amend HB 795 by deleting lines 1 through 3, inserting lieu thereof the following. To amend chapters 2 and 9 of Title 34 of the OCJ relating to the Department of Labor and Workers' Compensation, respectively, so as to provide for certain administrative functions of such department and the State Board of Workers' Compensation to authorize the Commissioner of Labor to prescribe certain rules and for other purposes. Mr. President, that concludes the order. Chair recognize Senator from the 9th to present the bill.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, bring this to you. It's an agency bill from uh, the Department of Labor. The underlying bill, HB 795, will allow the Labor Commissioner to order background checks on employees that deal with uh, federal tax return information. This gets us into uh, compliance with federal law. And then I will speak to Amendment 1. Um, currently, the Board of Workers' Comp, they have a, a position that's called the uh, Administrative Law Judge Emeritus. This is kind of an archaic thing that's really old. It's been around forever. Uh, it is actually costing us a little extra money. They want to do away with that by phasing it out. We're not taking away any current benefits that employees have today, but any employee that's hired after June 30th of 2018 would no longer qualify for this position in their work. I will yield for any questions. There are no questions, Senator. Senator from the ninth, you've spoken to Amendment One. Chair, recognize Senator from the nineteenth to speak to Amendment Two. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. Uh, the Senator from the ninth spoke to you about a position that the State Board of Workers Comp had. There's also another position; it's Director Emeritus. The first part of this uh, amendment strikes that language after. June 30th, 2018, again, not affecting anyone who's currently in office. There's a section four that also says that the State Board of Workers' Compensation should send their rules and regulations to the General Assembly, just like uh, Department of Revenue and the EPD do uh, for review, as, as we talked about, pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act. Thank you, Mr. President. If there are no questions, I'll yield the well. We do have a couple questions. Yeah. Chair, can I send them repeat third? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Yule. Yes, sir. Is it not true that this amendment only requires that the State Board of Cr uh, Workers' Compensation to send the General Assembly a copy of the rules just like the DNR and EPT does? Yes, sir. Why wouldn't we want to do that? I think we would. That's a good thing. I support your amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I will yield the will. Chair, recognize Senator from the ninth. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I was gonna. I had a couple questions for the senator when in the, when he was in the well, but he's yielded. So, uh, I wanted to speak to his amendment number two, at least uh, the second part of that, which which does bring the Board of Workers Comp uh, underneath the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, that does sound like a like an okay idea. The problem is, I, I don't believe that he uh, ever dropped a bill that would have done this. I know there was never a hearing uh, in the Workers Comp in the Insurance and Labor Committee, so I really haven't had any feedback. I, I don't know why that they're not currently covered under the APA. I don't know if there's any reason why they haven't been brought up underneath that. Uh, and if it had gone through the, the regular committee process, uh, more th it's possible I would support it. But at this point, I have no idea. So it's very difficult at this time to know if this is a good idea. It seems like maybe a good idea on the surface. Uh, I, would, I would actually ask him to, uh, I would work with him in next session. Uh, should we both be fortunate enough to be reelected? Uh, to go through this and have it go through the committee process and, and to be able to ask the people and ask the stakeholders um, if, that's, if, it is a, if it is appropriate or if maybe there are any reasons why it shouldn't be there. Uh, and I will uh, yield the well. Thank you. I ask you to vote yes for Amendment 1 and no to Amendment 2. Do you want a question? Or? Chair, can I ask Senator for the 19th for a question? Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Yield. I will yield. Senator, is it not true that this amendment does not bind the State Board of Workers' Comp to all the things of the Administrative Procedures Act? I'm sure you know of what you speak. Okay. You stated earlier that it bind, bound workers' comp to the Administrative Procedures Act. Is it not true that it only binds them to send a copy of their rules to the General Assembly, just like we require other agencies, including the Department of Revenue and including the EPD? I'm sure you're knowledgeable of what you speak. Thank you so much. Question is on Amendment Number 1. Is there objection? Is there objection to Amendment Number 1? Without objection, amendment number one is adopted. Question now is on amend amendment number two. Is there objection? There is objection on amendment number two. 
by the senator from the ninth. All those in favor of amendment number two will rise, stand, and be counted. If you are in favor of Amendment 2, rise, stand, and be counted. Reverse. On amendment number two, the yeas are 30 and the nays are seven, and the amendment has been adopted. Question now is on. Is there a committee, sir? No? No committee, sir? Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreed for the committee which fail pass the bill? Chair is not. All those in favor of the bill. As amended, we'll vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary, unlock the machine. On the pass of the bill, the yeas are 53, the nays are 1. This bill, I'm the Constitution, majority is therefore adopted. Secretary, or excuse me, Chair will recognize Senator from the 8th. Mr. President, I ask for unanimous consent to remove House Bill 956 from the table. Read the caption. House Bill 956, by Reverend Pergold, 155th, the bill will be done in Nyckman, Chapter 3, Title 43 of the OCJ, relating to veterinaries, veterinaries and veterinary technicians and for other purposes. Is there objection from removing it from the table? Without objection, the bill has been removed from the table. The Secretary will read uh, the bill and amendments. HB 956, by Reverend Pergold, 155th, the bill will be done in Nyckman, Chapter 3, Title 43 of the OCJ. Relating to veterinarians and veterinary technicians for other purposes. Mr. President, Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs offers the following substitute to HB 956, a bill we title enacted in Chapter 55, 43 of the OCJ, relating to veterinaries and veterinary technicians and for other purposes. Amendment 1 by Senator Wilkinson of the 50th offers the following amendment. Amendment the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs substitute to HB 956 by inserting after line 17 the following to amend Article 4 of Chapter 12, Title 4 of the OCJ, relating to medical and other confidential information. For other purposes, Amendment 2 by Senator Heath of the 31st offers the following amendment. Amendment the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs substitute to HB 956 for replacing line 1 with the following to amend Chapter 1 of Title 4 of the OCJ relating to general provisions relative to animals and for other purposes. Mr. President, that concludes it. Chair, recognize Senator from the 8th, present the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. We have a uh, revision or update of the Veterinary Practice Act before you. Uh, this is uh, particularly interesting to me because 18 years ago I came into the House and as a freshman was put on the subcommittee that uh, they were trying to rewrite the Veterinary Practice Act. It had already been worked on for a couple of years, spent two years working on it and uh, wasn't able to get uh, it accomplished. We had uh, a lot of controversy with it. Uh, the next term, a young freshman come in from uh, Brennan and uh, joined in with this in, in two years. Uh, we were able to put together uh, the current uh, law that uh, if you look through this, you will see the changes that are made that uh, the uh, 
very few, very simple. It just updated some of the language, struck out some stuff that's no longer relevant, uh, updated the uh, uh, laws having to do with uh, administering speed uh, that has uh, medicine added to it, uh, makes it in compliance with the uh, federal law. Uh, it's really uh, makes me feel good to know that the quality of our work at that time has stood up this long with as little changes that need to be made in it. We've got a couple of amendments that have been offered. Uh, uh, these are two bills that uh, one of them that you've already been voted on and got over to the House and couldn't get out of the uh, Rules Committee. Uh, the second one uh, is the second has to do with a bill that passed over in the House and they uh, couldn't get out of power. These are very good bills that uh, need to be added to this. If there be any questions, I'll try to answer them. No questions, Senator. Thank you. Chair, can I Senator for the 50th to present Amendment Number 1? Thank you, Mr. President and members of the Senate. Uh, amendment number one would uh, simply state that if a person is bitten by a dog and a physician requests the uh, rabies vaccination history of the animal within 24 hours of the bite from the veterinarian, the veterinarian would have to produce the uh, record of the rabies vaccine. If there are no questions, I yield the well. No question, Senator. Chair recognized Senator from the 31st to speak to Amendment 2. Thank you, Mr. President. This has been addressed. This um, Amendment number 2 includes Amendment number 1. That was just a s sort of happenstance. Uh, but it also includes language from Senate Bill 257 that we passed on January the 31st of this year. I appreciate your support. Do you, uh, do you want to yield for a question? I know I appreciate that very much, uh, but the minority leader had a question for you. If you'll yield. So, Senator, yield? I do. So, so this amendment could make it harder to bring charges against a factory worker and protect some animals, like goats and poultry, but those same protections wouldn't be in place for certain other animals. Is that not true? This only applies to food animals, but I'm not sure that this applies to a factory worker. Does not Ch include pets. Chair, can I send him the 50th for a question? Will Senator yield? I yield to the Ag Chairman. Senator, is it not true that we have already passed this bill by a decisive margin earlier this session and that I strongly support this amendment? Do you know of which you speak? No further questions, sir. Thank you. Questions on adoption of amendment number one offered by the Senator from the 50th. Is there objection? Without objection, amendment one has been adopted. Question now is on amendment two offered by the Senator from the 31st. Is there objection on that bill? There is objection. Objection has been filed by the minority leader in the far left corner. <laughs> far left corner, I might add. All those in favor of Amendment 2 will vote, will rise, stand, and be counted. Rise, stand, and be counted. If you're in favor of Amendment 2, rise, stand, and be counted. Reverse. Huh? 
On amendment number two, the yeas are 27, the nays are 14, and amendment two has been adopted. The question now is on the adoption of the committee substitute. Is the objection? Without objection, committee substitute is adopted. Does any other senator wish to speak for or against the bill? Is the objection agreed to the committee which failed to pass the bill? Chairs none, Porter committee is agreed to. Shall the main question be now put? Are the objections? Chairs none, main questions ordered. Shall this bill now pass? Question on the pass of the bill. All those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed, no. Secretary will unlock the machine. <laughs> Senator from 26, your light is on. What purpose? <laughs> By accident. On <clears throat> passage of the bill, the yeas are 46 and the nays are 6. And this bill, MC Rex Constitution Majority, is therefore adopted. <laughs> We're going to need to take a 15 minute recess. Um, the, uh, just to prepare for uh, allow the Secretary of the Senate's office along with staff to uh, get everything else in order and we'll come back with a new list of table bills uh, and some special orders. 